Great, thank you, and thank you for having me this morning. It's a great topic. It's one I've been interested in for my entire professional career, actually. And for those of you who are incoming students to uh, the program, who have now been here for a couple of months, um, Putting this, getting a little perspective on public-private partnerships, when I started my career um, with an interest in getting into real estate development and trying to figure out how to create a path forward, the only professional opportunity at that time was to get an MBA. A very general degree for real estate really wasn't fitting. So when the Columbia program was created in the mid-1980s, it was addressing a real need. The increasingly sophisticated development process and at that time, it was becoming a, an accepted investment asset class like other asset classes, and, and it called for a professional approach to analysis and, and analytics, that sort of thing. Well, at the same time as real estate was becoming more professionalized in that sense, it was becoming more complicated in terms of the product types. Um, at, we are seeing this growth over the past 30 years in mixed-use development, in mixed-income housing, in infill development. Um, and, and that increasingly sophisticated um, type of real estate product requires an increasingly complicated approach to development, um, which we're going to talk about this morning here about how to go about that. Um, so a previous generation of developers were able to be uh, successful by focusing on a single property type and sort of building in isolation. But we've now come to understand that real estate is really very much about context. And it sort of works two ways. On the one hand, real estate's an interesting type of business because you're building a product, you're satisfying a consumer demand, but at the same time, you're creating the context that people live their daily public lives in. You're creating the environment of the public sphere. But the converse of that, of course, is that context creates value for real estate. I mean, real estate might be a great product, but it's not worth very much if it doesn't have neighbors that have amenities, retail, um, other uses, access to mass transit, um, quality of life kinds of uh, amenities, parks and open space, cultural facilities, um, educational facilities. All these things are the context that creates value. So. Um, Real estate today really is very much about working in a context. I, I, we've, we've moved from the period when uh, single-use, isolated projects were the norm to today the norm is we're working in an urban environment. And so because of that and because of the fact that you're affecting the environment, uh, the issues rise to the surface much more readily in terms of the interests of your neighbors. There's a range of competing interests for development, of course, because the design, the density, uh, the uses, all these things are a matter of great interest to the, to the public and to your neighbors. And so that expresses itself in a political uh, format. Um, and it makes development just that much more difficult and complicated. Um, and in order to address these kinds of issues, you really need to be in the mode of collaboration and consultation, as Patrice talked about. Um, it's really become part of the toolkit of development. You, you can't exist in isolation anymore. Um, and so the sophisticated kinds of leadership that is enabled to engage a community is really critical for real estate development today. And I think that generally the public is aware of the leadership role that private developers play because that's very much in, in, in the papers. Um, you know, the compelling stories that they have to tell about how important their product is and, and, and that sort of thing and how they gather the, the resources. And, and we, we celebrate that and we should. And many of you, you know, see that as the path forward on the private side. But what is, I think, less well appreciated is the fact that there are public entrepreneurs out there who fulfill essentially the same function um, they could be in government, neighborhood organizations, uh, volunteer citizen groups. Um, they come from a vast range of types of entities and, and organizations. Um, they also create a vision of how a, how a neighborhood can change, what should be built there. Um, and this vision typically advances a set of public goals, not just one goal, but several goals. Um, it, it typically, job creation is, is one that's often talked about, but open space, transit improvements, 
how to, how to integrate cultural institutions. And, and so today, of course, we're fortunate to hear two projects that do exactly that, that advance a broad range of public goals. So um, public-private partnerships in, is a format that can advance these public goals. And um, you can advance them, of course, more readily by enlisting the power of the market. Um, the marketplace is what drives real estate, and so there's a, there's a, a power to move things forward with that. Um, but it doesn't necessarily fall to the private developer to harness that power. Um, they, need to, they need to earn a return. They've got investment capital. They've got their own time and resources they're investing. They need to earn the money back. And so pu the public elements that comprise this um, public-private partnership or this vision, that is, of how a neighborhood and a city can change um, can't necessarily be easily underwritten privately. So you, you need to look to other resources. And so these public goals often require public resources to match up with them. And what developers often think about is, uh, you know, subsidy. You know, how, how many dollars can I get? And you see that in housing and other areas. But public resources are much broader than that. It could be land. Um, it could be complementary infrastructure investment that's coordinated. Um, we do a lot of that at the MTA where we try and work with developers to coordinate their developments with a new subway entrance or other public improvements. Um, it could also be how do you shape the regulatory powers of government? Zoning is critical. Um, and the Highline story, of course, is one that really um, is very much integrated with the whole notion of creating a zoning district that shapes the the uses nearby, but also at the same time addresses some very fundamental concerns about how do you put a public structure through private property? You can't take the private property because that's unconstitutional. So how do you address that? And so zoning is a tool to advance those purposes as, as well. Um, so to ensure that these resources get committed requires that the public entrepreneur convince public leaders, constituency groups, and others that the broader public purpose is being served by this vision and, and helping to marshal the resources that are necessary. Um, this is not an easy job. Qualifying for public resources is difficult, time consuming. Um, you of course need political support, but there's a lot of just nitty gritty stuff, statutory issues. How do you comply with certain uh, requirements that are mandated uh, by one program or another, sometimes they don't match up. Um, one program might require you to do one thing, another something else. How do, you, how do you deal with these? How do you balance these things? That's really the role of the public entrepreneur to help uh, create that, um, that unified approach where the, things are, think, where the different resources get balanced. Um, but it, the, the, I think that you can say that, that um, public-private partnerships uh, are actually similar to private uh, development in terms of the elements of success. Um, first of all, you have to have market demand. Um, there, as I said, you, that really is what drives real estate. But you also need to have good design, and I know many here will appreciate that, but it's, it's really fundamental. How do you design for the uses that are part of this project, the functional needs of these uses, and balance that with the, the needs of the context, with the uses that are there, the traditions of the community, the histories, the goals of the community, that sort of thing, the adjacent uh, public spaces and other attributes that you have. Um, and of course, the entrepreneurial resources necessary to secure the, 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 the uh, resources the, to, and to move the project forward. So public-private partnerships are complicated. A lot of players, a lot of conflicting goals have to be reconciled and subject to public scrutiny. You're, you live in a fishbowl. Um, and so it, they're, they're, they're difficult and they're daunting, but the payoff of this complexity is, is huge. A successful project can create enormous public value. And so today we're gonna hear about two projects that are really transformational. Um, you know, starting from a vision of an area, a vision of a neighborhood, a vision of a, of a public space in the case of the High Line, 
and created essentially a new context for these neighborhoods, responding to the old context, responding to the, the resources, the, the opportunities that are there, and then shaping something new and creating really two new iconic neighborhoods. Um, I think it's safe to say that Chelsea is probably one of the highest value neighborhoods in New York City today, um, which you know, 20 years ago would have been a laughable thought. Um, and downtown Brooklyn is now kind of you know, the hip center of, of the United States. Again, 20 years ago, who, who would have thought of that? So the, you'll hear the case studies this morning and you'll learn about how they created these projects, how they responded to the opportunities, the needs of the context, how they engaged the stakeholders, including the residents, other cultural institutions, good government groups. Create, how do you create a shared vision, balance all these competing needs, all these competing goals? And then how do you match the resources, the public resources, the private resources, so that you can really ensure success? And to the students at, at the, in the real estate program, hopefully these uh, studies, these, these, these projects today will really fire up your imagination and really create for you uh, a sense of the challenges, the opportunities that lie out there and really give you some, some as well some good tools and insights into how you get these things done. So look forward to hearing from the panelists this morning and thank you again for having me.